This is the sequel to The Wish. The names and places were changed to protect these individuals' privacy. If you haven't listened to that one, let me just say this. That individual and his family has gone through some stuff. I hope no one has to experience these kind of things. Anyway, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to purchase some merchandise to support the channel, that link is in the description as well. Thanks, everyone. Money over family. There are many things we can pick and choose, but family isn't one of them. By no means is any of them perfect, but for sure some of us are blessed with better ones than others. Some of us come from broken homes. No matter their circumstances, we still have to play the cards life dealt for us. I was nine at the time, and we just moved away from my dad's side of the family to live with my mom's after burying him. We still lived in Massachusetts then. That summer, one of my aunts and uncles from Oklahoma bought us plane tickets to visit them. None of us had ever flown on a plane before except mom, so we were ecstatic. We never owned a car since our parents didn't drive, and none of the kids I knew ever flew on a plane, so I felt it was something I could brag to them about. Just the thought of our family not having a car, but being able to get on a plane and travel thousands of miles to a place none of the other kids had ever been brought a huge smile to my face. I might as well told everyone we were flying to the moon on a spaceship. As a kid from a poor family, you took what you could get and waved it around the other kids' heads. It was tough beating the other kids since they constantly had the newest toys and gadgets, cable TV, McDonald's, and the list goes on and on. So you do it when you get the chance and be like, oh yeah, have you ever flown on a plane and traveled thousands of miles to a place you've never been? No, I didn't think so, but I have. Then the other kids would have just brought up more things to shut me up, like making fun of my shoes because I had on a pair of Speldings. But that's besides the point. So we finally landed in Oklahoma and were at the airport. It was then that I had the biggest culture shock of my life. I've never seen so many white folks in my life before. Everyone there talked funny, and I couldn't understand why. It was the first time I've ever heard people use the word y'all. Even my relatives there talked that way. Some people had on cowboy hats and boots. Before, the only person I saw looked like that was Yosemite Sam, and he was a cartoon character. I might as well have been on another planet. Our aunt and uncle Tsung greeted us. They weren't the same ones that purchased our plane tickets. That was another couple who we'd meet later. We got our bags, then stepped out into the parking lot and was hammered by a suffocating heat wave from out of nowhere. If I didn't know any better, I could have sworn we were literally walking into an oven. We finally reached my aunt's Ford Bronco. Although it had only been a few minutes walk, everyone was drenched in sweat by then. We threw our bags into the back and got inside. That was the first time my brother and I met my cousin Ting. I'll never forget our first conversation. Hey, my, my name is Ting, like the light, he said, extending a handshake. W what are y'all's names? My younger brother John and I looked at each other, smiling in amusement, then shook his hand as we introduced ourselves. He seemed to stutter a bit as well. Not sure if it was from excitement. Ting was our age and was super friendly. It wasn't what we're used to, where we're from. When we got to their house, where we were to stay most of the trip, we met all his sisters and baby brother. Ting showed us his treehouse and weapons. I was disappointed, to say the least. The house wasn't in a tree. It was more like a tower with a five-rung ladder allowing access to the entrance. But it was good enough. And while I was expecting nerf or water guns, his weapon's cache was nothing but a bunch of branches off a tree. John and I looked at each other and chuckled. Later on that week, we met Aunt and Uncle Kay and their son Kenji. They were the ones who purchased our plane tickets. Everyone seemed pleasant enough except Kenji. He was older by a few years and taller than us. Not many kids I know wore hats, but he had on a teal blue baseball cap with a San Jose Sharks logo on it. Unlike Ting, Kenji didn't greet or introduce himself to us. 
Not that I cared, but he carried himself like he was better than us, as if we weren't worthy of his presence. If there were a picture of the word stuck up, he'd be it. Hey, K Kenji, this is Chua and John. They're, they're, f they're cousins from Massachusetts, Ting said. The preteen said nothing and continued eyeing us as he stood by his parents. Then Uncle K shouted in Mong, What are you doing? Where are your manners? Go shake their hands. Kenji rolled his eyes and reluctantly gave each of us a half-hearted handshake. A few days later, his parents dropped him off while all the adults left. It was then he finally spoke to me. He asked me about some generic things that felt more like an interrogation than a conversation. I answered each question, speaking in Hmong and English together. Can you not speak in both? He interrupted me mid-sentence at one point. Golly, it's very annoying. Sorry, I said, blushing. I finished the rest of the response in English. I've never had anyone tell me that before. I imagined his Hmong wasn't very good, as he never used it, and I would be right years later. All the native-born Oklahomians were like that. Whenever they spoke, it sounded something like, Be by be lo lu je, ga i lu buk. That weekend, Aunt and Uncle K took our family to an amusement park. He paid for everything. We were so excited and thankful, since no one has ever taken us to an amusement park before. He bought us merchandise, drinks, and food. It was the first time I truly felt loved and appreciated from someone other than my parents. Our vacation in Oklahoma was truly a memorable one. The day came when we had to fly back home, and I cried my eyes out because I didn't want to leave and go back to a place where no one cared about us, a place where we barely existed in anyone's eyes. I didn't know how much I longed for a father figure or just someone who cared. For once, I thought maybe I knew what it was like to have a father. It made me miss my dad and thought if he were still alive, maybe we'd get to do things and go places like all the other kids did. Uncle K stopped by Ting's house before we left. He took me aside and handed me a $20 bill. He said, Here, take this, son. It's so you can get something to eat on the road. Don't cry. I will always be here. You can call or visit me anytime. I said nothing and kept crying like a big baby with tears and snot all over my face. He hugged me and rubbed the top of my head. Then we bid everyone goodbye and left for the airport. Uncle K called to check on us when we got home, and I cried again for a second time. That was the last time I spoke to him until years later. I was 13 years old when we eventually moved to Oklahoma. We sold or gave away everything we owned except the clothes on our backs. The family there were Christians because Uncle K was a pastor, so my family started going to church for the first time. For the first few months, we lived with Ting's family until we finally moved to Uncle K's rental down the street, not knowing that would be the start of our problems. Everything seemed okay initially. Whenever repairs were needed, he made them. Mind you, these were minor ones, and the house was pretty old. I wasn't handy at all, but it wasn't like we were calling him all the time but he started getting annoyed. This was also before YouTube existed, so I couldn't just learn it on there. He was called over for a plumbing leak under the sink once. He rang the doorbell and I answered. Without even saying a hello, he said, Why do you always call me for help? When you have a girl, are you going to call and ask me to show you how to do it too? He had the most condescending smile on his face. I was hurt, but said nothing. I didn't know why he had to say something so disrespectful, especially being an elder and a Christian. He was no longer the compassionate and caring uncle I once knew at nine years old. After that, I never called him for repairs again, not if I can help it. Whenever we needed something done, we called a service from the Yellow Pages and paid them with our own money. Several years later, when I was at a gathering in California, my aunt Pa came by and we had an interesting conversation about the house we were living in. Son, she addressed me and Mong, what is to become of the house your family is living in once y'all become of age? The question got me curious, so I said, I'm not sure what you mean, auntie. Your mom hasn't talked to you about the house at all? No, I shook my head. How old are you now? she asked. Nineteen, I answered. She paused for a moment like she was considering something, then said, your mother loaned your aunt and uncle K $25,000 for the house. The deal was when you turn 18, they're supposed to sign that house over to you. 
and take the profits or money made from Section 8 assistance to make up for the money they invested. So do you know how much they've made from Section 8? And are they still paying for the rent? She asked. I didn't know such an arrangement existed. I do know Section 8 is still paying for it since my siblings aren't 18 yet. But they have reduced the payment, I responded. I'd hate to see what would happen if the payments stopped coming in. Please be careful. Despite your uncle claiming to be a man of God, he isn't who he appears to be, she said. My heart dropped at hearing her words, and a knot formed in my throat. I was flabbergasted by the news, but stayed composed, and asked, Is this true, Auntie? Yes, son, it's true. Please discuss this with your mother. I don't want anyone taking advantage of your family or doing anything bad, Aunt Pa replied. I'm sure Aunt and Uncle Kay wouldn't do anything bad. We're family, I said. I hope you're right. We never truly know people's hearts, but when money is involved, there's no telling how far they will go. Please be careful. I flew home the next day and couldn't stop thinking about what Aunt Pa said and why hadn't Mom told any of us. A week went by before I talked to Mom about it, not knowing the best way to approach her, so I decided to bring it up after dinner one evening. We were both in the living room. On the TV was a video of a couple exchanging Hmong poetry in a lush green field. The volume was turned up. Mom was on the floor glued to the TV like a kid. She was hard of hearing, so I had to get close to speak with her. I tapped her on the shoulder, and she turned to me. Mom, we need to talk about something, I said. She turned so her ear was facing me as she leaned in closer. What did you say? I said there's something I need to discuss with you, I replied a little louder. What is it? Mom asked. I lowered the volume on the TV, then went over what Aunt Pa discussed with me in California and asked if it was true. Yes, she said, and continued her story. This arrangement was already discussed before we moved here. Your aunt and Uncle Kay said there was a house for sale close to your aunt and Uncle Tsung. It was for $50,000 and asked if I could loan them half the money. They said we could rent it out and they'll take the money from Section 8 to pay back their share once you children are old enough. They'll sign the house over to you. So when we got here, I gave them all the money I saved over the years. Why didn't you tell us? What if they don't follow through with it? I asked, unable to contain my annoyance and frustration. I don't think Auntie Kay would do that. We're sisters. I began fearing the worst. Aunt Pa's words replaying in my mind. We never truly know people's hearts, but when money is involved, there's no telling how far they will go. Despite him being a man of God, he isn't who he appears to be. Mom, I'm already 19. How much does Section 8 pay a month? I asked, leaning out a deep breath. She thought about it for a second. $750. I kept the statements they send every year. Let me see them. She got up and headed to her room as I paced back and forth, trying to keep my composure. Had I known about their arrangement, I would have paid more attention. Mom came back after a moment with a stash of mail in hand. The one for this year is on top, she said, handing me the stash of opened envelopes. There were six in all. I quickly went through them. The letters show an amount per month for each year. Four of them displayed $750, and the rest of them with $500. I knew the rate decreased when I turned 18. My siblings were twins and two years younger than me. Section 8 will stop all payments the following year, I figured. The calculated numbers for the total amount paid since we started living here was $42,000, excluding the current year. Mom, they've almost doubled their money since the arrangement started. Based on the numbers, this should be our house. Have you talked to them about this? I asked. No, I haven't, Mom responded, her face filled with concern. I ran through the numbers for Mom, then she said, This doesn't include the $600 to repair the fence or the amount I gave them every month for the property tax. I did not know about the fence nor the property tax money she has been giving them. Then I said, It's fine if they honor the deal, but if they don't... I paused, not wanting to think about a situation where Aunt and Uncle Kay wouldn't follow through with it. Then I asked, Did y'all write down a contract? We didn't. At the time, I didn't think about it. I sighed and pinched the bridge of my nose, taking a moment to process the situation. I'm going to call them, I said. As the phone rang, Mom was still coaching me on what to say to her. Aunt Kay picked up on the fourth ring. As we exchanged greetings, Mom stopped talking. I got straight to the point, asking about the arrangement they had with Mom. She didn't deny it. 
based on the numbers from Section 8, y'all should have received a profit on your initial investment. So, we haven't. She cut me off. I don't understand what you mean, I asked. We haven't profited anything. The numbers from Section 8 doesn't include the amount we put into the repairs and maintenance on the property, the woman responded. Right, but the initial agreement didn't consider the amount you put into the property, just that when y'all get your original investment, and when I turn 18, y'all were going to sign over the house to us. The conversation went back and forth, without progress or solutions. Eventually, it got to the point where we were both yelling over the phone. I was saying she was in the wrong, and she called me ungrateful. At one point, she said, Now I know why Hmong people say, Never raise an orphan child. When you raise an orphan child, you gain an enemy. When you raise a lone chicken, you get a meal. To which I replied, No one is trying to make an enemy. All I'm saying is, y'all need to honor the agreement. We're spending our own money on repairs on a property that was supposed to be promised to us. The rest of that conversation was a blur. I couldn't remember which one of us hung up first, but I was livid. Mom was there during the conversation and could tell it didn't go well. I was at a loss for words, not sure what could be done. We'd lost all of our life savings. I was already working part-time and attending community college, but there was no way we'd able to save enough money within a year for a place of our own. Plus, I never bought a home before and didn't know what it all entailed or who to go to. We didn't pay for any repairs unless it affected our well-being after that. That summer, the AC went out. We'd have consecutive days of temperatures being over 100 degrees, and that day was no different. There was no way anyone could survive in that heat without AC, so we had the unit replaced for a couple thousand dollars. After that, the internal system had issues, and that was another thousand dollars to repair. It seemed like it was always one thing after another. That was a really old house, and as I've mentioned before, it needed a lot of repairs. In 2008 of the following year, we were forced out of the home after Section 8 stopped making payments. They gave us a month to move out. They referred us to their real estate agent, but it was just to expedite our departure. Eventually, we found a home and moved out. The Ks gave that house to their son Kenji, and he continued renting out the property. Thankfully, it worked out for us during that time as home values were down. We managed to scrounge up what we could, with each of us working for a down payment. It has been many years since then. Each of us are married with kids and have our own homes. To avoid the same mistake mom made, we eventually sold our first home and split it three ways. We no longer talked to the K's after the fallout and never got our money back. The couple also had a falling out with aunt and uncle Tsung over a piece of land they purchased together. They too have stopped speaking to one another. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I believe it. You hear stories about things like this and never expect to live through them. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I'm no saint, but evil and shady people exist in the most unexpected form. I never thought a pastor, let alone our own family members, would do this to us. Was it the love of money that changed these good people, or did it reveal who they've always been? I guess I'll never know. One thing I do know is, please be careful who you put your trust in, and never do business with family. And if you have to for whatever reason, always, always make sure to put it in writing. It's an unfortunate reality, families can be torn apart like this. I hope the younger generations learn from these mistakes. The only thing for us to do now is to keep moving forward. There's no sense in dwelling in the past. That concludes Money Over Family. Thanks for listening. Please like, comment, share, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. You can also support the channel by purchasing merchandise from the link in the description.